أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين For the hastening of the reappearance of the Master, the Imam of our time, Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan al-Askari, recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In one of the beautiful maxims of Imam Zain al-Abideen, and they are all beautiful. The Imam states, "Man ishtaqa ila al-jannah, sara ila al-khayrat, wa sala an al-shahwat. Wa man ashfaq min al-nar, badara ila al-tawbati ila Allah min jami'i dhunubih, wa raja'a an al." The Imam says that if you claim to love something, then surely that love should manifest in physical reality. If someone says that I know how to drive, the best litmus test, the best way to tell whether they can actually drive or not, is to put them behind a wheel and say, prove yourself. Let's see if you can truly drive. If someone claims to love his wife, then surely on the anniversary, there's gonna be a long list of expectations. Same thing goes for the husband. And same thing goes for any claim that is very easily made, but often difficult to substantiate and to prove. Because to make a claim only requires a verbal statement. But to prove it requires action. In this beautiful hadith, which I selected for tonight's majlis, from the words of Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam, Allahumma salam The Imam says that if you claim to have a desire and a yearning to go to paradise, then the first thing you do is that you start looking for righteous deeds, good opportunities to manifest this desire inside of you in reality. Let me give you another simple example. Say your friend comes up to you and says, let's go on a vacation to the Bahamas, or let's go to Ziyara in Karbala. By the way, Ziyarat al arbaeen is coming up. Inshallah, those of you who are on the fence, those of you who are not quite sure whether they can make it or not, all it needs 
is to call out the name of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and ask him to help you overcome whatever obstacle that you have. And usually the way it works is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he is testing us, he reciprocates whatever you, you take the initiative and then he reciprocates it. Meaning Allah says, Udhkurni, udhkuruni athkurkum. Remember me and I'll remember you. Allah has already taken the initiative of creating us, giving us everything that we have, providing us with everything that we need. But now he wants us to show that we are serious about this. So if you feel like you're unable to go to ziyara because of a financial situation or because of a, a matter dealing with your school or work or what have you, go to ziyara and leave the rest up to Imam al Hussein, inshaAllah. So if somebody tells you, let's go to ziyara, and you really want to go to ziyara, then the first thing you'll start to think about is how do I manage this trip and all of the required, the very long list, to do list that has to be provided and has to be checked before you're able to go on that trip. For example, you need a passport. If you need a passport, the first thing you'll do is apply for your passport. You will need tickets, you will need accommodation, you will need all kinds of different things. Different things. You'll need transportation. What do you do? You try to facilitate those means so that the trip goes smoothly. If you desire to go to paradise, what do you do? You have to check off those points in the to-do list. You have to prepare and facilitate the trip. So the Imam says, Man ishtaqa ila al-jannah, sara'a ila al-khayrat. Number one, any good opportunity that presents itself, don't say, oh, I'll take the next one. Take this one so that the next one is also made available to you. Don't say, well, I won't go to Hajj this year, even though I can, or I won't go to Ziyara this year, even though I have the ability to do so, I might do it next year. The thing with righteous deeds is that it's a compound effect. You build it one step at a time. Just like when you build a house, you build it one brick at a time, right? You have to start somewhere so that the next step could be made available, so that the next opportunity is presented to you. If you have an opportunity, seize it, take it. Don't delay, don't procrastinate. And inshallah, we'll talk more about that. Sara al al khayrat, number one. Number two, you have to remove any obstacles from the way. For example, if your parents are not satisfied or pleased with you going on a vacation, you have to address that problem. You can't say, well, I applied for the passport, I got my ticket, and the parents thing will just take care of itself. That's an obstacle, that's a problem. The Imam says that there are obstacles in your journey to paradise, you have to address them, you have to remove them. Sara'a ila al khayrat, number one. Number two, wasala an al shahawat. We talked about this last night, brothers and sisters. There is an insatiable beast inside every one of us. A savage, vile creature that's just waiting for the opportunity to come out. And it usually comes out when we're alone. It comes out when we have motive and opportunity. When we have the means, when no one is supervising us, no one is looking. That's why it is highly discouraged and makruh, according to our scriptures, for someone to sleep alone. This new trend that exists in Western society, as well as Eastern societies, where people are living a solo life that compels them because of their, the circumstances of their you know, education or work, that they end up renting apartments and they live on their own. Tiny little cubicles, studio apartments, Nobody wants to be with roommates. Nobody wants to share. And so what ends up happening is that you have this massive rising trend in society where people live on their own. We have so many traditions from the Prophet and his immaculate household. 
saying that this grants the shaitan an opportunity to come and intervene in your life. Because when you're alone, it's a lot easier to fall into sin. When you don't have the social deterrent of friends, family, relatives, that's why therapists and scholars say that if you find yourself engaging in a sinful habit and you're unable to stop the habit from recurring, one way to, to address that is to surround yourself with good company. Is to try not to ever be alone. Because when you're alone, the shaitan sees an opportunity. What do you do? Instead of having your own private bedroom, try and create a living arrangement where you're sleeping with other people. Instead of living on your own completely, try and find a good friend or someone that you can share your accommodation with. Moving on. So the Prophet says, the Imam, rather Imam al-Sajjad says that if you truly desire paradise, you have to seize good opportunities, even if it's in a very small way. For example, you see a good cause, someone raising donations for a mokim, for example. The service stations from Najaf to Karbala or from Basra to Karbala that provide facilities and services to the Zuwar and the pilgrims of Imam Hussein salam contribute. If you can't go to Ziyara yourself, try and help and facilitate for other people to perform Ziyara. Ziyaratul Arbi'een today, brothers and sisters, is by far the greatest show of strength that the Shia have had in centuries. Not just today, but in centuries. It's one of those pivotal turning points in our history that I think at this point in time, because we happen to live in the eye of the storm that is Ziyarat al Arbi'een, we don't quite understand its power, its magnitude, its greatness. We don't quite understand it because in the eye of the storm, things are pretty calm. You don't know what's going on. Until the storm passes, until the tornado goes, do you then see the aftermath, the consequences of it. Ziyaratul Arbi'een is exactly that. It is as pivotal, perhaps, in shaping the future of the Shia faith as some of the more monumental events in our history. Like, for example, the migration of Imam al-Ridha from Medina to Khurasan and his layover in the city of Neshabur, which is another discussion for another day. Those were momentous events that forever changed the course of our history. Ziyarat al Arbi'een is that. Brothers and sisters, seize it. History has also taught us that these windows of opportunity don't always stay open. How many times were we able to do Ziyarat? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam only to be prevented from doing so for another several generations to come. How many times has that happened to us? Let's take a lesson from history. This incredible show of force that you see today, this festival of generosity and kindness that people experience when they go to Ziyara, there is no guarantee that this is going to stay forever. There's no guarantee. One shift in the, in the government of Iraq, one change in the geopolitics of the region, one seismic event, politically speaking, or war, perhaps could not end this ziyara, but maybe severely limit it. Suddenly they'll say that an entire ethnic group is not allowed to go to ziyara, which is actually the case right now. Most Afghans are unable to go to Ziyarat to Imam Hussein in Karbala. Why? I have no idea. Why is the Iraqi government so shameless in the way it treats foreign Zuwar? I have no idea. They'll have to answer to all of this. And they issue a statement this year saying that we have decreased the, the visa fee by a dollar. As if somehow they're doing us a favor. So seize this opportunity. Don't say I'll do it next year or the year after that. Go to Ziyarat to Imam Hussein, even if it costs you money, even if it's painful and difficult, that's part of the test. Somebody said to me that this year I'm thinking of going to Sham instead of Karbala. 
I said, where would Sayyidah Zainab be this year? When you go to Ziyara, you share in the grief of Zainab alayha salawat rabbi. You walk as if you're walking with the caravan. Yes, you'll get some blisters in your feet, but so did the tiny feet of Ruqayya. Yes, you might bleed a little bit, but so did the neck of Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam. It's a part of it. That's how we show solidarity. That's how we express our love for the Imams and the Ahlul Bayt. حَقٌ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ مُؤْمِنٍ وَمُؤْمِنَةٍ أَنْ يَزُورَ الْحُسَيْنِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ It's a debt that we are repaying to Rasulullah. We're not doing anybody any favors. That's why when you go to Ziyara, even though it's a debt, but look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you. Fatima al-Zahra says in her Fadakiya sermon, وَجَعَلَ الْحَجَّ تَشْيِيدًا لِلدِّينَ Allah created Hajj so as to renovate, solidify, strengthen religion. If somebody's religious practices or beliefs have some cracks in it that could use a good plaster or renovation, they go to Hajj. And this also applies to Ziyarat al-Imam al-Husayn you see a youth who's struggling with their prayers, for example, struggling with their basic tenets of their faith, struggling with any aspect of their religiosity. Just go to Ziyarat al Hussein alayhi salam, Ziyarat al Arba'in, three days. Three days of walking from Najaf to Karbala will restore their religion to its pristine form. And the hadiths in that regard are too great for me to talk about for the next. Hundred nights, hundred nights. Just look up Kamil Ziyarat by Ibn Quluway, Radwanullah Ta'ala Alayh, the teacher of Sheikh Al Mufid, who's buried in Kalvamain. The book's translated into English. I encourage anyone who's going to Ziyarat, even if it's not your first time, pick up that book. Kamil Ziyarat. Read it and tell me that you weren't deeply influenced by it and the traditions in it. Moving on. The Imam says that you have to avoid those obstacles that stand in your way, right? Just as when you're about to go on vacation, you avoid obstacles, you're about to go to paradise, avoid obstacles. What are those obstacles? Shahawat. Desires that pull you left, right and center. Shahawat. Then the Imam says, and if you wish to avoid the fires of hell, the torment of the inferno. If that is truly something you fear, if that's something that keeps you up at, at night, if that's something that scares you, what do you do? The first thing you do, and yatuba ilallah ta'ala min kulli dhunube. Repent. Repent. This is the ark of salvation. This is the lantern of guidance. This is the season of Muharram and Safar. This is a time attributed to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Ask Allah in the name of Hussein to forgive your sins. It starts with one commitment. That's, that's all it takes. Astaghfirullah Rabbi wa atubu The minute you say that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up the floodgates of His mercy towards you. If we could recite a salawat and try and get a little closer, inshallah. Rahimallah, man dhakar al qa'ima min ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Try and get closer, brothers. There's, there's more space here. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajal faraj wa ajal faraj. Ahsantum, jazakum Allah khair. So that we may be blessed by the intercession of Imam Zain al Abidin on the Day of Judgment, recite a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The Imam says, if you're truly afraid of burning in the fires of hell, may Allah repel the fire from all of us by the grace of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, then you must repent to him. And you must extract yourself from acts of sin and transgression. Brothers and sisters, this is what it all comes down to. It's about avoiding sin and doing righteous things.
But let me take a step that's beyond that. The ultimate goal and objective of a Shia, a follower of the Ahlul Bayt isn't merely to avoid that which is haram and to do that which is wajib and to stick to the basics and to live in mediocrity. That's not our goal. If you are looking for a yardstick, if you're looking for a gauge, some unit of measurement as to whether you can call yourself a Shia or not, then I would use something different to just a binary halal haram system. I would put it this way. Ultimately, as a Shia, your goal should be to, to satisfy your Imam and to avoid doing anything that displeases the Imam. So this is, this is beyond halal, haram, wajib, mustahab, makruh, right? This is a much simpler, much better, much more superior yardstick, right? And oftentimes when it comes, when it comes to halal and haram, there's obviously a lot of details to work out, a lot of issues to ask about the job of determining what is halal and haram rests on the shoulders of the faqih, jurists, our esteemed scholars, maraji, may Allah bless them and prolong their lives. But when you say that my ultimate objective should be to please my imam and avoid anything that displeases him, that doesn't always require a scholar. Why? Somehow you know. Somehow because of the primordial nature, the upright nature of what, what, what we call in Arabic al-fitrah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, you're able to make that determination much easier. And you can actually determine whether the act that you're about to embark on is satisfactory to the Imam or not, right? But really what it all boils down to is the concept of taqwa. Brothers and sisters, our faith, our religion is so nuanced and so fixated on the concept of taqwa that if you look at a subject, for instance, the topic of animal rights in Islam, which I don't want to talk about, but there are entire chapters about animal rights in our primary works of jurisprudence that, that are so mind-boggling. You see some of those ahadith and instructions of the Ahlul Bayt and, he, and you say to yourself, even modern 21st century Western liberal capitalism has not reached this level of compassion for animals. There's a lot of talk about animal rights, right? Animal cruelty. There are certain countries that don't export live animals. Australia is one of them. New Zealand is another. New Zealand has 45 million or so sheep and it's one of the biggest exporters in the world. But they don't export any live sheep. Instead, they have to slaughter the sheep in abattoirs and prepare the meat for export. Why? Because they say when we put the sheep in those ships, they are treated with cruelty. They go through a lot of pain. The journey all the way from New Zealand up to the UK or Brazil or China or what have you is an arduous journey and we don't want to put animals through that. That's admirable. You think to yourself, well that's beautiful. Let me give you a couple of examples from how Islam says you should treat animals in a manner that puts everybody else to shame. Number one, Rasulullah in a hadith sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam He instructs his followers to clean the barns where animals reside. Not only that, I mean who cares about a barn? Who cares about the places where you store these animals? Well we care. Not only that, the Prophet says clean 
the nostrils of animals, of your cattle. If you see they have a runny nose, clean their nostrils, clean their noses. <laughs> number one. Example number two. The Holy Prophet says that he's talking about the rights of animals. And one day, in fact, the Prophet was sitting down speaking to his companions. When he was about to get up, he noticed that there was a cat that had slept on his cloak, on his abaya. Instead of waking the cat up, he simply tore his abaya and got up and left. Furthermore, the Prophet says, in النار, A woman was thrown in the fires of hell because she caged a cat and did not feed it until it died. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we will do to you what you did to that cat. You go to hell for this because of a cat. There is a hadith that I saw the other day in Wasail al-Shia, which was quite extraordinary. The Imam says, Al-Qittatu min ahlil bayt. Meaning that a cat, if you have a cat, you should consider it as a member of your household. It's like any other member of the household. Look after it, feed it. Imam al-Sadiq says that cattle and animals have six rights over you. One of which, I won't talk about all of them, one of which he says that you should never be sitting on the back of a horse while talking to your friend. In other words, if you're sitting on the back of this horse, you only do so in, in order to get from point A to point B. If you want to talk and chat with your friend, then you get off the back of the horse, then talk to them. Mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. This is how far taqwa extends into our everyday lives. Taqwa extends into the ecosystem that surrounds us. Not only the interpersonal relationships, not only how we treat each other, not only how we show respect to our parents and our spouses and our siblings and our children, but even how we treat the ecosystem. I'll give you two more quick examples. Sheikh Yusuf al-Bahrani, the incredible, legendary, luminary, Faqih of the highest caliber, the author of one of the works of Fiqh called uh, Al Hadaiq. In that book, he says that one of the one of the responsibilities of a Muslim ruler, listen to this, is that if there is a person who keeps silkworms in their home, for whatever reason you have silkworms, right? Obviously, you keep silkworms, so they produce silk. He says that silkworms survive on grape vines, on leaves. If this owner of the silkworms doesn't provide the worms with leaves so they can survive and thrive, then the Muslim ruler has a right to confiscate his property, sell it, and buy leaves for the silkworms. The second example, and I'll conclude with this. Amir al-Mu'mineen, on the last night of his life, is about to leave the house of his beloved daughter Zainab salam, and head toward the masjid. You all, you've heard this I'm sure, on his way out, the, the Imam encounters a group of geese. As he's about to leave, the geese start to flap their wings and make noises. So the Imam said, Sawa'ih, tatba'uha nawa'ih. These geese are now flapping their wings, wings and making noises, quacking and whatnot. And soon they will be wailing and crying in the home of Zainab Then Amir al muminin points to his daughter Zainab. She says, make sure you feed these geese. Make sure you quench their thirst. Wa illa, and if you're unable to do that, leave them so they can eat and provide for themselves. If you can't provide for them, don't keep them here. Don't torture them. This is how far taqwa extends, brothers and sisters. 
taqwa extends so much. Perhaps I'll mention this example as well. That traditions tell us that if you're sitting in a gathering and there are three people sitting there, two start whispering to each other as they normally do, right? You're sitting next to somebody, you start talking, right? But they're not just talking, they're whispering. If the third person is observing them, you should not do that. Why? Because you make that person feel inferior. It's almost like you're saying that I don't trust you. You have a secret to tell your friend? Well, get out of the room and tell them over there. Unbelievable how Islam ensures that using these social etiquette, using the laws that pertain to animal rights, and then going all the way into the topic of social interaction and whatnot, is here to say you need to observe the boundaries of taqwa. You need to ensure that you do good and you refrain from sin. Because refraining from sin is even more important than doing good deeds. Ishtinabul sayyiat awla min iktisabil hasanat, as the hadith says. It's a lot more important to refrain from haram than to do all good deeds and then all of a sudden burn it with one sinful act. And that was precisely the problem that Imam al Hussein encountered. It was that people like me, who claim to be Muslim and claim to be followers of the Ahlul Bayt. But in practice, it was a completely different story. In practice, taqwa was non-existent. Imam al Hussein encountered a lot of people. And each of those encounters needs to be documented, assessed, studied, examined. Because in each of those encounters, there were examples that we need to learn from. There were those who refused to join Imam al Hussein from the very beginning, like most of the people of Medina. And boy, did they pay a heavy price for that. When Musrif, the commander that was sent by Yazid ibn Muawiyah, came back to Medina within two years and slaughtered the entire town. Of course, I'm not saying they deserved it, but that's what you get. That's what you get when Imam al Hussein leaves the holy city of Medina at night with his entire family and no one even asked why he was going. Failing to support the Imam or join him or even ask, Ya ibn Rasulullah, what happened? Why are you going? No one even bothered. Then you have the people who decided to let the Imam go because in their mind they were doing tawaf and they were going to Hajj, they were going to Arafat. Remember Imam al Hussein left the night before people go to Arafat. Laylatul Tarwiyah. So in his mind, oh, I'm going to go to Tawaf, right? People like Abdullah ibn Umar, for example, who Imam al Hussein approached and he said to him, Ya ibn Umar, ittaqillah wa la tada'anna nusrati. Fear God. We're talking about taqwa. Fear God. Guard yourself against sin and don't abandon me. I'm giving you an opportunity, seize it. I'm giving you the chance to cleanse all of your colossal, foul, disgusting sins that you've accumulated on your back. You know, Abdullah ibn Umar was one of the people who refused to give allegiance to Amir al Mu'mineen when the entire nation of Muslims gave allegiance to the Imam after the death of Uthman. He said, Oh no, as a Precaution, I will not give my allegiance to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was one of them. The other was Al Qais ibn Al, al, al Ash'ath ibn Qais, right? And there were others, some of whom might shock you. If I tell you who they are, might shock you. One of them was Usama ibn Zayd, the commander of the army, the young man that the Prophet sent and said, he was one of the people who refused to give allegiance to Amir al-Mu'mineen out of taqwa, out of ihtiyat. So the Imam said to him, come and help me. He looks at the Imam, he says to him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I loved you, I remember seeing you, this young grandson of Rasulullah, Sibt of the Prophet, 
the Prophet used to kiss you, the Prophet used to say such and such about you. And then he said to the Imam, don't go. You want my advice? Now what's interesting is that the Imam isn't even asking you for your, your advice. The imam, the imam is telling you to come. And here you are offering your expert advice on the matter. Don't go. I'm afraid that something is going to happen to this beautiful face of yours. What does Imam Hussein say in response? He says, Woe unto you and this logic of yours where it's about cosmetics and it's about how beautiful I look. You don't have to worry about my tender skin, my soft skin. There are more important things to think about here. More important ideals and principles that we are concerned about. I'm willing to give my beautiful son Ali al Akbar in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ashbahu nas khalqan wa khuluqan wa mantaqan bi rasulillah. To the point where Imam Hussein came to him, there was no safe spot on his body that the Imam could kiss. This is a logic we don't subscribe to. It's not about the makeup, it's not about the cosmetics, it's not about the aesthetics, it's not about how beautiful you look. It's about how beautiful you act. And so, that was another group of people. Refused to join the Imam, even though the Imam invited them. Gave them the chance and the opportunity. And there were others. But what I want to talk about here is a group of people who were proactive, right? They joined the Imam before it was fashionable, before it was popular. I'll give you one example that truly inspires me. Ibn Sa'd, not Umar ibn Sa'd, Ibn Sa'd, who's a Sunni historian and scholar, has written a book called Tabaq, At Tabaqat al Kubra popularly known as Tabaqat ibn Sa'd. In that book, he narrates a hadith when talking about the companions. He says there was a man by the name of Al-Uryan ibn Al-Haytham. Al-Uryan ibn Al-Haytham says that my father and I used to go out into the desert and we would go for hunting or whatever and we used to come across a land on which Imam al Hussein was later murdered. At the time, the Imam had not been killed yet. This was perhaps in the time of Amir al Mu'mineen or Imam al Hassan. He said, We used to go out there, and there was always this young man from Bani Asad who was hanging out and just not doing much, but he was always there. So my father once said to him, He said to him, Ya Asadi, O oh man of Bani Asad, what are you doing here every time we come, we see you as well? He said that I have heard I have heard hadiths narrated from Amir al muminin that Imam al Hussein will one day die here. So that's why I try and spend as much time here as possible so that when the chance comes, I can stand and defend him. Al-Uryan ibn Haytham says that several years later we heard that Imam al Hussein had been killed. My father said, let's rush to that place called Karbala. We went to that location, we saw bodies littering the barren deserts of Nainawa. My father said, quick, let's go and see if we can find the Asadi. We looked and sure enough, we found him among the dead. There's a big difference between someone who joined Imam al Hussein at the last minute and was hesitant about it and even left the Imam. There's a man called Harthama. Harthama switched sides from the army of Ibn Sa'd to that of Imam al Hussein even before Hurdid. Imagine that. Way before things got complicated. He ran from the army of Ibn Sa'd, came to Imam al Hussein. The Imam said to him, Why did you come here? He said, Ya Aba Abdullah, I just remembered I was with your father Amir al Mu'mineen when we were coming back from the battle of Safin or Jamal rather. And Amir al Mu'mineen, when we got to this location, min the Imam lifted a handful of sand. He smelt it and burst into tears. 
We said to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, Mimma bukaok, why do you cry? He said, Sayuqtalu ala hadha al-ard rijalun yadkhuloon al-jannata man ghayri hasab. There were, there's going to be people who die on this land who will enter paradise? No questions asked. I just remembered that it was right here. That's why I'm here. The Imam said to him, Idhan anta ma'ana am alayna. Are you with us or against us? He said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I have a family. La lakum wa la alaykum. I got children, I have a house, I have a mortgage, I have a job, I have a car. These are typical excuses, right? I have this, I have that. Anything but God. So, will you excuse me? The Imam said to him, you're excused. The Imam never forced anybody to join him. It was an open invitation. The Imam said, you can go. But let me share something with you. If you're going to not support us, then make sure you get as far away from here as possible. Because if you stick around until you hear me cry out, and you do not support me, you will be thrown right into the abyssal hole of the fires of hell. And I don't wish for you to do that. So leave, go. So the man says, He says, I began to run so that when the war began, I didn't hear Imam al Hussein's pleas for help. You have these kinds of people. Then you have the Asadi, who makes sure he goes to Karbala in anticipation of Ashura. And sure enough, that's why people like him and like the other companions of Imam al Hussein, they will be among those who will rise and answer the call of Imam al Mahdi, Ajjalallahu ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif. It takes a lot of hard work to be like Habib ibn Mubahir. It takes a lot of preparation. Brothers and sisters, again, I'm not saying avoid sins. I'm not saying do good things. I'm saying you should anticipate the event and the opportunity even before it comes up. I'm saying please the Imam of your time so that when he comes, there's no question as to which side you're going to stand on. Try and please him every day, somehow. Avoid the things that displease him. So that when the Imam comes, you don't find yourself hesitating or thinking, what do I do now? No hesitation when you've trained yourself, when you've worked on disciplining yourself to be a supporter of Imam al-Zaman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the return of the Imam and gives us a stark warning, brothers and sisters. He said, when the Imam comes, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ نَفْسًا إِيمَانُهَا لَمْ تَكُنْ آمَنَتْ مِنْ قَبْلُ أَوْ كَسَبَتْ فِي إِيمَانِهَا خَيْرًا فَانْتَظِرُوا إِنَّا مُنْتَظِرُونَ When the Imam comes, it's too late to say, what do, I get? what do I do? Which side do I stand on? You need to have already prepared yourself. Do you know why? Because it's like you being at the train station. Imagine, this is the difference between one who is waiting Imam al-Sadiq says that inna lana dawla. Listen to this hadith. Inna lana dawla. One day we will get to rule. One day justice will be restored. One day the wrong that was done to the household of Rasulullah will be righted and, those, and that blood will be avenged. One day the evildoers will face the the, the repercussions of their actions. One day, the Imam says. But if you wish, the Imam says, and that time will come. But if you wish to be among those who are counted with the supporters of Imam al Mahdi, he says, number one, listen to these conditions. Wait, anticipate, expect. Number one. Number two, 
وَلْيَعْمَلْ بِالْوَرَعْ Avoid sins, be pious. Number three, وَبِمَحَاسِنِ الْأَخْلَاقِ Try and embody the best morals. Try and be the best version of yourself. Try and be the perfect representation of a follower of Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt. Now what does the Imam mean when he says wait? Again, take the example of someone waiting for a train. You might go to the train station half an hour before it arrives, right? Or 15 minutes, or 20 minutes. The closer the time it gets to the train's arrival, the more focused you are on the train coming, right? You keep looking at your watch, you keep looking at the screen. Because you know when the train comes, it's not going to last. It's not going to stay there for too long. You have at best a 10 second window, 15, 20 second window, right? If you were there for half an hour or an hour or an entire day, but you missed that window because you got a phone call at the last minute and you became distracted, the train goes away and it's not coming back, right? Anticipate the return of the Imam by pleasing him and avoiding things that displease or anger him. If only our followers, the Imam says, may Allah give them the backing, the support to be obedient to him. If, the, if they only did what united them around our service and our obedience, then the luxury and the pleasure and the honor of visiting us would not be far from them. In fact, the Imam himself would come and see you as he has done with numerous ulama and scholars and so forth, and righteous people. So, you have to anticipate it. You know, there were people who encountered Imam al Hussein who missed the opportunity by a hairline. I'll give you a couple of examples. One of them was At-Tarimah ibn Adi and at tari At-Tarimah was a solid Shia. He, his loyalty to the Imam was unquestionable. The problem was procrastination. The problem was not having made a solid commitment. It's, it's about missing the train. It's about missing the boat. Missing that opportunity when it presents itself. He came from Kufa and encountered Imam al Hussein on, on the way. He asked the Imam, what are you doing? The Imam said, I'm going to Kufa. The Imam then asked him to join him. He said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, absolutely. No question about it. But the reason I was in Kufa is because I was stocking food for the next season. I've made my, my, my shopping and now I want to go back and deliver this to my family. I will come to you, Ya Aba Abdullah. Just wait for me. Right? Then he said to the Imam, why do you go to Kufa? If your goal is to destroy the tyrannical regime of Bani Umayyah, I have a better option for you. Ya Ibn Rasulullah, come to Yemen, where he was from. I can guarantee 20,000 fighters from my own tribe alone will join your cause. And we will most definitely win this war. Why wouldn't you when the commander is Hussein and 20,000 Shia are with him? He said to the Imam, come, let's do that. Plus, if the encounter happens in Yemen, Yemen is a difficult place, it's a difficult territory to invade, as I think the past couple of years have demonstrated, right? Yemen is a very rugged, mountainous region. And so over there, it'll be a lot more difficult for them to kill you, you know, instead of you being in this open desert where you are an open target. The Imam said to him, well, that's not how it works. God has other plans. Sha'Allah and Yarani Qatil. What about your family? Sha'Allah and Yarahum Nasabaya. This mission will not be complete until Zainab gets taken as a captive, as a prisoner of war. That's not how it works. Yatarimah. So then he said to the Imam, let me go back and deliver the food and then come and join you. The Imam said to him, I'm afraid you won't be able to do so. I'm concerned. He said, no, I'll hurry. He went. By the time he came back, he heard 
the cries, Allah laqad qatalna al Hussein ibn Fadl. It was too late. Too late. Procrastination. The biggest opening for the shaitan is when you're presented with an opportunity to commit sin and say to yourself, you know what, let me think about it. Right? Let, let's, let's see how things go. Let me give you another example. Al-Hur, I am too insignificant of a speck to disrespect or God forbid criticize a legend such as Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyah. But I will say this, not as a criticism, but as a means of diagnosing the problem so that we could avoid it. So that we could ensure we don't fall into the same trap. Do you know what the problem with Hur was in the beginning? It was the fact that he blocked Imam Hussein's passage to Kufa. Then when it was time for Salah, Imam Hussein told Hur, you lead your people in prayer, and I lead mine in prayer. So he said to the Imam, absolutely not. Ya binti Rasulullah, nusalli bi salatik. We will all pray behind you. Why is that problematic? It's problematic because on the one hand, you are refusing to allow safe passage for Imam al Hussein, And on the other hand, you also want to pray behind him? You want to have the best of both worlds? Is that what it is? You want to dine with Muawiyah and pray with Ali ibn Abi Talib? And that is a problem that we, I wouldn't say all, but it's a universal problem. Where we like to keep our options open. I'm not saying that this world and the afterlife are always in conflict. That there is constant tension between them. I'm not saying that you can't have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. What I'm saying is, traditions are pretty clear. That there are times when there is diametric opposition between the two. Right? I said this a couple of nights ago, if you remember. I said, there are certain acts, I am not a takfiri. I am, who am I to judge whether someone is a kafir or not a kafir? Whether you're a Muslim or a non-Muslim? But there are certain acts which we know are antithetical to Islam. They're incompatible with Islam. Try and install a Windows application on a MacBook. It's just not going to happen. Vice versa. Not going to happen. They're not compatible. Certain acts are not compatible with Islam. They're diametrically opposed. And so... On the one hand, you think you can pray behind Imam al Hussein, but also stand in his way? That's our problem. We like to keep our options open. What happens though, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ultimately put you on a crossroad and you have to make a choice. And it's that crossroad, and it's the tension between the dunya and the akhirah that ultimately led Hur to start shivering while he was sitting on the back of his horse. His friend says to him, what? What's going on? Why are you shivering? Why are you shaking? Why are you trembling? He said, because I see myself This is it. I can't make any excuses anymore. I can't say, oh, I want to have the best of both worlds anymore. This is it. Decision time. Make your choice. And we are faced with those choices, brothers and sisters, on a daily basis. You have to make that choice. Which is it going to be? You want to follow the path of Imam Al-Hussein? You're willing to join Imam Al-Hussein, you have to make sacrifices. Or you want to take the other path, which you're more than welcome to take. But you will miss the greatest opportunities of all. You will miss being in the caravan of Hussein, in the caravan of the Ahlul Bayt. Now, I apologize. May Allah bless you all. Being here these past few nights, five nights, enduring these programs, the heat, the cold, the rain, whatever it is, 
This is a sign of your love for the Ahlul Bayt, of your loyalty to Abba Abdullah al Hussein. That in itself is a great step in the right direction. Let's just try and make sure that we maintain this path of serving the Imams and satisfying them and pleasing them as much as possible. Every day, wake up in the morning and say, Ya Hussein, scholars would stand. Ayatollah al Udma said Abdul Hadi Shirazi, who was a grand marja in the holy city of Najaf, they say that every time he stood to perform salah, he would recite the adhan followed by the iqamah, then he would pause and then he would say Allahu Akbar. They said to him, Sayyidna, Awlana, what's that pause? What do you say in that pause? He said, I say, Assalamu alaykum ya Abba Abdullah. Why? He said, because without Imam al Hussein, we would never have been praying today. Without Imam al Hussein, there would be no Hajj, there would be no Zakat, there would be no Amr bil Ma'roof, there would be none, none of the religious values that we have today would exist without the supreme sacrifice of Abba Abdullah al Hussein. Imam al Hussein to us, brothers and sisters, is such a central part of our very religion. Can I mention an example for you that will be mind-boggling? One hadith says that the Holy Prophet stood to pray. وَقَفَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ لِكَيْ يصلي. Imam Hussein was a child. And perhaps a year and a half, two years, he came and stood next to his grandfather, Al-Habib Al-Mustafa. The Holy Prophet said, Allahu Akbar. Imam al Hussein imitated his grandfather. He also tried to say Allahu Akbar, but because of his young age, he couldn't quite get the words right. So the Prophet repeated it, Allahu Akbar, so that Imam al Hussein could also say it. He tried to say it, but he couldn't quite get it right. The Prophet did it the third time. Again, Imam al Hussein didn't quite get it, get it right. He did it the fourth time, the fifth time, the sixth time, and the seventh time when the Prophet said, Allahu Akbar. The young Hussein also said, Allahu Akbar. Imam al-Sadiq says, it is because of this, because of Imam al Hussein trying to say it seven times, it is recommended and mustahab that whenever you pray, you say, Allahu Akbar, takbiratul ihram, not once, but seven times. Imam al Hussein is more than just the grandson of Rasulullah. As great a position as that is, more than just the son of Amir al Mu'mineen, as great as that is, more than just the son of Fatima al Zahra, as great an honor as that is, Imam al Hussein himself is a central figure in our faith and our religion. Without him, nothing would exist. Now, I talked a little bit in the beginning about the rights of animals, right? Imam Zayn al-Abidin salam is on his deathbed. Bi Abi anta wa ummi ibn Rasulullah. Ya Zayn al-Abidin, Ya Ali ibn al Hussein. The things you had to see, the things you had to endure, the cries you had to hear on the day of Ashura. And to live with that for 34 years, the Imam was on his deathbed. He started to give his final wishes and testaments and will to his son, Imam al-Baqir. Among those was these instructions. The Imam said to him, you see this she-camel of mine? The Imam had a she-camel. He said, I have performed Hajj 20 times riding on this she-camel. And I have never beaten it with a stick, not once. So I ask you, my son, that when this she-camel dies, that you don't leave the body out for beasts and wolves and lions to eat it. Instead, I would like you to bury it with honor and respect. Allahu Akbar. Even the she-camel gets buried, right? Even animals get to be buried? SubhanAllah. <coughs> بأبي أنت وأمي يا أبا عبد الله ما مثل يومك يا أبو اليمك يضح 
So he said to him, I want you to, make, to bury my camel because I took it to Hajj for 20 years. So they say that when Imam Zain al-Abideen was martyred and passed away and was buried by his son Imam al-Baqir, the she-camel suddenly came out of the barn and went straight towards the grave of the Imam, beating its head on the ground, almost as though the camel was crying for the passing of Imam Zain al-Abideen. It did that. So Imam al-Baqir said, take the camel back. It's grieving for, she's grieving for her owner. So they took the camel back inside. The camel then ran out once more, started beating its head on the ground, almost as though it is mourning and crying for Imam Zain al-Abideen. So Imam al-Baqir says, leave her alone. She wants to grieve, let her grieve. She stayed there for three days and then died. So Imam al-Baqir did as instructed by his father and buried the camel. Allahu Akbar. This is one animal and its loyalty to its master, its loyalty to its owner. There was another one on the day of Ashura. The horse of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam says, that when Imam al Hussein fell from the back of his horse, to lift Aba Abdullah from the ground. But how do you do that when Imam Hussein's body looked like that of a hedgehog filled with arrows, his forehead broken from the rock of Abu al a three-pronged arrow piercing the Imam's heart. The horse tried to revive Abu Abdullah. When it couldn't do that, it came and started to wipe its neck on the blood of Abu Abdullah. It would then circle around the Imam, trying to protect him. Protect him from what, Ya Ibn Rasulullah? Imam al-Sadiq says, Firqatun bis-sihan, wa firqatun bis-suyuf, wa firqatun bil-rimah, wa firqatun bil-hijar. رحم الله من نادى وحسينا ومظلوما وغريبا احتوشوه من كل جانب يا صاحب الأمر والزمان Where was Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas when Abu Abdullah was left alone? Where was Ali al-Akbar? Where were the companions of Abu Abdullah? The only one left to protect the Imam is his horse. Then the horse came towards the camp. Imagine, ya mu'mineen, if you are sitting at home, then your father comes inside. He's breathing heavily. The children say, Father, what happened to you? He says that there is a violent gang that was following me, trying to hurt me. As the father is sitting, speaking, speaking to his family, suddenly there is a knock on the door. The father goes to answer the door. Then you hear a cry. You hear your father scream, what happens to the children? What happens to the little girls? Allahu Akbar! The horse came back to the 
Shekam. Imam Zaman describes these difficult moments. Fa'ada farasuka muhamhaman bakia. Imam al Baqir says the horse was trying to say, Avvalima tavvalima. Min ummatin qatalat ibn bint nabiyaha. Fakharajna nisa min al khudur al atimat. Aywa wa ilah wa musibata. The first sign that Abba Abdullah was not coming back was that the saddle was now sideways. Imagine Ruqayya, what was she thinking? Did my father fall back from the fall from the back of the horse? Well, the answer is that Ruqayya never knew what happened to Abba Abdullah, which is why on the afternoon of Ashura when they came came to offer the children water. Everyone refused to take it. Fatima al kubra wouldn't take it. Sukaina wouldn't take it. No one took the water except Ruqayya, the three-year-old of Abba Abdullah. To everyone shocked, she took the water. But instead of drinking, she headed straight for the battlefield Avatar. Oh, Father, I just heard you say, وَحَقِّ جَدِّي أَنْ عَطْشَانِ أُسْقُونِي شَرْبَةً مِنَ الْمَاءِ I just brought you water, my Father, to quench your thirst. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله.